And then they say, well, you only care about the babies before they're born. After they're born, you don't care about the babies. And then they try to shut down all the Christian adoption agencies that are helping the babies once they're born. And so it's funny, they're, they're almost trying to do a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're trying to make an argument and they're trying to shut down all of the mediums that prove that their point is incorrect. Hey, fellow tacticians, be sure to like this video and subscribe and ring that little notification bell that supports this channel's conservative content, which is good for me, good for you, good for America, but really bad for the dark cyber overlords at YouTube. So argument number seven on the pro-abortion side, you're only pro-life until birth. Or, you know, a modified version of this one is, oh, you're, you're only pro-birth, you're not actually pro-life. So it, either way, the implication here, uh, generally speaking, when you ask somebody to follow up on that and tell them exactly what you mean by that, when you ask, okay, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean that I'm only pro-life up until birth? They'll give some kind of answer, and it can take many different forms. But the most common one is, well, you don't support things like welfare, or you don't support medical care for the mom or the baby afterward, and you don't, you know, support this social program or that social program. Uh, I actually did a segment long ago. It wasn't on the the special episode, but I did a segment a while back now that was on I think AOC basically making exactly this claim that well, I don't want to hear anybody. Well, well, I'm sorry, I almost I almost forgot to do AOC bar. Like, I don't want to hear, like, anybody, uh, like, you know, um, supporting pro-life unless you're, like, in favor of all the, like, welfare programs and stuff. Like, th that's the version of the argument you usually hear. Why is it that you only care about the baby until they're born and then afterward you're like, hey, kid, fend for yourself. Okay, so we're going to go through that one. It does take a little time, and there's a lot of data, a lot of articles to mention on this one, and all of the sources are available here in the description. All of the sources, we're going to cite them as we go along, so you can find these and, and use them if anybody brings this up. So first of all, it is important to bring up that this is a pretty obvious red her herring fallacy. So before we get into any of the data, before we actually do a deep dive into whether or not this claim has any truth or merit to it, we're acknowledging right on the offset, it is a red herring fallacy. This is a bringing up something that has absolutely nothing to do with the argument at hand to try to deflect and to say that, well, no, you, you shouldn't be qualified to even enter this debate. It is a way to shut people up and distract them from the actual issue. And the reason that I say that is you could apply the same logic to just about any political position. And I actually think that this one would make more sense. I, this is still a red herring fallacy, but I'm just going to give you an example of a red herring fallacy on the other side. So if I were to say, for example, to a Democrat, well, you can't be for defunding the police unless you favor constitutional carry. Because if you're going to defund the police, you need people to be able to carry concealed. Now that actually does make some sense because it doesn't make sense that they're against you having guns and also against the police being able to come in and rescue you because, you know, there, there is a uh, sort of a disconnect there. But regardless, that is an example of a red herring fallacy. You're trying to shut them up on one issue by trying to say that they're not qualified to talk on it unless they agree with you on this issue. Again, it's just a distraction tactic. That's all that it is. They don't actually want to have the conversation with you. And because of that, they are specifically trying to come up with a way to shut you up because they don't want to have the conversation because they know if they actually have the conversation, they're probably going to lose. That's why most of the arguments when it comes to abortion really do boil down to red herring fallacies. But uh, ultimately, that's really what it is. But I always thought that this was really bizarre rationale. Like, it's a very strange position to take, even if you are pro-abortion, because, I mean, it would really be like saying you can't be in favor of the person having a right to their own life unless you're willing to provide all of their basic needs, goods and services, that kind of thing, which is just a, a dumb position to take. Like, I, I can't care about somebody's life unless I'm willing to foot the bill for all of the things that it's going to take to keep them alive. That's a bizarre thing. And it, and it really does illustrate the difference in positive and negative liberties. So the difference in positive and negative liberties is a negative liberty is a liberty that people are not allowed to do to you. So I'm not allowed to just walk around one day and decide I don't like your dumb face. And so I shoot you with a pistol. I just walk by and shoot you in the face because I don't like how it looks. I, I can't do that. Why? Because that brings harm to you. That is a negative liberty. 
And so the law says that I'm not allowed to do that to you. That's a negative liberty. What's a positive liberty? A positive liberty is one where a person says, this is what the government must do for you, or this is what an individual must do for you. So slavery, for example, I know that's an extreme example, but it's the best one I can come up with. That's a positive liberty because it says to another person, regardless of what you want, regardless of uh, any other extenuating circumstances, you are my slave, therefore you must do X for me. And when you boil it all down, that's what welfare programs actually are. They're saying whether you want to or not, I'm going to, under the penalty of law and the risk to you of being in prison for not paying your taxes, I'm going to force you to pay for my stuff. That's what welfare programs are when you really boil them down. It's a positive liberty. And by the way, this is not my vernacular. The left has been saying that they really would prefer positive liberties for decades now. And so we won't get off uh, way into the weeds on that, but that's the difference. See, I'm in favor of negative liberties that the mother in this case is not allowed or the doctor to say to the baby, you know what, I think I'm going to kill you because you're unborn. And that's what I want to do. They're not allowed to do that because that's a negative liberty. I'm not necessarily for positive liberties. I'm not saying that if the doctor is unwilling to kill the baby, he then has to pay for his college or something like something ridiculous like that. So in favor of negative liberties, not in favor of positive liberties. And to that point, it would be as ridiculous as saying, you're not allowed to shoot hobos unless you're willing to buy a house for them. What you're saying that I can't be opposed to someone just going around and randomly murdering hobos unless I'm willing to buy houses for all of them. Yes. That's a dumb argument. <laughs> I'm sorry, that doesn't make any sense. That's like saying, I, I'm not allowed to care about your life unless I'm willing to pay all your bills for you. And so we're dealing with exactly the same thing when it comes to abortion. And so uh, it really doesn't make any sense on its face, but even ignoring all of that, even ignoring the fact that it's a, a very obvious distraction tactic, that it's very obviously just a tool that's designed to shut down the conversation, not actually flesh out the conversation or talk about these ideas. Let's just ignore all that for just a second and go through whether or not the claim is actually true that Christians and pro-life people generally are people that don't really care about the baby. And, and, you know, if it's in the womb, they care. But after that, they just, it's whatever. They just leave the kid to fend for himself. All right, so let's look at that for a second. First of all, uh, the data on this is somewhat scarce. And I'll just very openly admit that it's very hard to track things like private charity, especially when you consider that conservatives tend to favor private charity, which is much harder to track than government programs because they all come from a single source. Like it's real easy to tell how many people are helped and how many dollars are dealt out by a government institution because A, they have transparency laws and you have to have Freedom of Information Act uh, requests and that kind of thing. Really easy to find that data out really hard to track data, especially when you're talking about millions of Christians and hundreds of thousands of organizations all across the country that are helping people in these situations. And so there's not like a singular source that tracks all of these things, and it's really hard to get data. But we're going to do the best that we can to look at this data and find out if Christians are really as cold and heartless towards the people that have already been born uh, as these uh, people on the left are claiming. So first of all, let's go here. And take a look at this. This is from the Heritage Foundation. So this is about specifically adoption agencies. And uh, that deals directly with children that are not aborted and then placed with homes. So this is from the Heritage Foundation. Private and faith-based agencies and networks can bring certain benefits to their partnerships with state child welfare agencies. For example... They may be able to tap faith into faith communities and attract new populations of foster and adoptive parents. In some instances, private providers may supplement the money they receive from state to care uh, from the state to care for foster children. Randy Daniels, vice president of international resource and program development at Buckner International, which provides child welfare services uh, provides for child welfare services in Texas said that the organization uses private donations to supplement, quote, about 35% on top of what the state pays us to care for a child to ensure the kids get better care, end quote. The money goes toward things that state dollars do not compensate, 
Quote, we pass more money onto the foster family for a child's school events, clothing, athletics, etc. We also do additional training, such as trauma-informed training. So this is one of the reasons that I say that the data is really scarce. How are you supposed to track that? Now, this is just one Christian organization in Texas, but they're specifically paying for things that the state dollars in Texas do not pay for. So it's things that are, like they said, school activities, if the kid wants to play sports or if the kid wants to be in band or something like that. And so these are things that private Christians take money out of their own pocket to pay for these kids that are in adoptive and foster care that can't afford things of that nature. And let's not also not neglect that this network directly works with people. And as the article stated, they can help tap into faith communities, which would suggest what? A lot of the people that are doing the adopting and fostering in the first place are also Christians that are doing so for charitable purposes. Now, we know that not everybody that professes to be a Christian is actually pro-life. All the real Christians are, and I stand behind that statement. But, you know, there may be some people out there that claim to be Christians that are actually not pro-life. But it's a very, very tiny minority. The vast majority of people that claim Christianity and actually live out their faith are people that are indeed pro-life. But you understand, after looking at that, why this is so much harder to quantify and give an exact number or an exact quantitative figure that explains exactly how much Christians are doing. So we're going to kind of take a broad sampling of this to explain all of it. So first of all, let's go ahead and take a look at this one, which this is from USA Today. And the USA Today is using the Department of Health and Human Services as their source in this article. There are more than 8,000 faith-based child placing agencies across the country. So people that handle things like fostering and abortion or uh, adoption, not abortion, uh, according to the Health and Human Services. In fiscal year 2018, Miracle Hill cared for more than 300 children and received about 600,000 from the state. So. This is a organization that we don't have time to go through the full article, but they were getting some state dollars, but the vast majority of their funding actually came directly from Christians, private donors, that kind of thing. And they were funneling that money to help facilitate these different adoptions and, and foster care and all of those other things. And there are over 8,000 different Christian organizations across the country that are involved in this. And by the way, these are just the ones they're able to track. There are probably a lot more that have no state ties. In fact, I know of one of them right here in Alabama, Agape. I believe that they do have some state ties in the sense that they have to work with the state and within the legal system. But so far as I know, they're completely funded by the churches. And they're an adoption agency. So there are tons of different organizations all across the country that are dedicated to helping kids in exactly these situations. Uh, not only to be able to find a loving family that can care for them, but also in supplemental care that happens afterward to help take care of the babies after they're born. And they're not the only example of that. We can go ahead and go to this example, which comes from Heritage Foundation. While FBAs, and that's faith-based associations, by the way, while FBAs do not dominate the child welfare arena, as Stephen Monsoma notes, Quote, they are an active and substantial part of it, unquote. Catholic charities alone provide adoption services to over 82,000 children from 2006 to 2016. In 2016 alone, Catholic charity agencies around the country served about 10,500 children through foster care and adoption services. And so it goes on to talk about that as well. But ultimately, you're seeing there a very consistent pattern. That's just the Catholic organizations. Now, Catholics are the best source to go to for this because unlike a lot of the, the Protestant world, they don't operate with autonomy and they're not kind of divided into local chapters. Catholics, because they have a, a large church superstructure, it's a little easier to quantify some of the work that they're doing. And so that's why they're a good resource. But here's the thing. Catholics are still a minority in the United States of America. And so if you're looking at the demographics of the country, about 23-ish percent of the population is Catholic, and you're looking at a 70 to 80 percent population that claims some form of Christianity in the United States of America, which means that if you're looking at 82,000 kids that are helped by Catholic charities, if that is, you know, somewhat the same proportionally, 
to the work that the Catholics are doing, you're looking at three or four times that if you adjust for population based on what we can estimate somewhere where the evangelicals are doing. Even if that was the only stat we had, that's still a lot of kids helped. But if you're multiplying it by the amount of, of Protestant charities that are in it and adding that to the work that the Catholics are doing, you can imagine that a vast majority uh, or a, a very large plurality, I don't want to say majority because, again, it's hard to look at exact numbers on this. Uh, I would estimate a majority, but I don't know that. Uh, there is a, a pretty big plurality of, of children that go through these services and are helped directly by faith-based associations. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take a look at just how generous Americans are, generally speaking, because, of course, uh, Christians tend to be in favor of things like adoption and fostering. We've already seen that from the stats so far. But let's also just look at charity generally. So for people that, you know, may have been aborted otherwise, but are alive today and Christians are able to help them out. Let's look at Pew Research Center. So you can see the chart there that. Americans that are highly religious, in other words, people that go to, and you can see there, uh, highly religious respondents are those defined as those who pray daily and attend religious services at least once a week. So these aren't even necessarily the cultural or, or nominal Christians. These are Christians that live out their faith, that take their religion very seriously, that attend church regularly, that pray, that read their Bible, that kind of thing. Look at the difference there. They are significantly more likely, 28 versus 45 percent, that have volunteered in the past week when this survey was taken. And for those who have donated money, time, or goods to the poor, you're looking at 41 percent of non-highly religious people to 65 percent of highly religious people. So the numbers from that are extremely clear. The more religious you are in the United States of America, when the more religious you are, the more likely you are to volunteer your time, your material goods, uh, whatever else you, you have it, you're more likely to have volunteered or have to given something to people that are in need. Now, that's a generic one that's not dealing specifically with adoption, but we've already looked at the adoption numbers and that bears out in the research that we've seen from there as well. So let's look at this as well from Philanthropy Daily. And in this report, the more religious a person is, the more that they wind up giving to charity. Uh, Plake goes on to say that the research shows that, quote, uh, practicing Christians are generous across the board, whether that means volunteering, helping a stranger, or financially supporting a church or a nonprofit. American Bible Society defines a, quote, practicing Christian, unquote, as somebody who identifies with a Christian tradition, attends church at least monthly, and considers it to be important in their lives. And when it comes to churchgoers, data shows that 87% of church attenders made donations to some type of church or charity compared to only 50% of those who do not attend. So you're looking at a difference of 37% when you're talking about churchgoers versus non-churchgoers when it comes to people donating to charity. This is the number one thing that determines whether or not you're giving to charity or not giving to charity is whether or not you're religious and you go to church and you try to live out your faith, which makes sense. It stands to reason based on the teachings of Christianity. And so this idea that, you know, churches are not supporting these kids or they only care about kids while they're in the womb and the second they're born, ah, we don't care about you anymore. I'm sorry, the data just does not bear that out whatsoever. Let's go ahead and look at this survey from Barna Group, which they specialize in surveying religious people, specifically with Christians. So this was a look at who all is adopting and, and what the demographics are of people that are adopting. So you'll look there, adopted a child, 5% of highly religious people, only 2% of people that are not religious. Uh, for those that are seriously considered, have consider, seriously considered adoption, 38% of Christians, only 26% of all adults. Uh, if you're looking at people who have been a foster parent, there's 3% of Christians that have only 2% of the general population. And for those who seriously considered fostering, 31% of Christians, only 11% of the general population. So if you're looking at these numbers across the board, the pattern that you see 
is that Christians are more than twice as likely as the general population to have adopted a child. So the idea that Christians aren't doing anything or aren't doing their part to help these kids in crisis, that's simply not true. And by the way, I could use personal anecdotes from this as well. We looked at the data, but I have friends that were adopted by Christians who were in danger of being aborted. There's one in particular, uh, I have friends that they were on the waiting list and they just adopted a brand new little girl. She's a little over two months old and I'm very excited because I actually get to go see her uh, this weekend. I get to meet her for the first time because they were in Utah and I, I've not actually got a chance to meet her yet. Um, but I'm actually going to get, get a chance to meet her and these friends uh, took her despite the fact that she was special needs and their first time parents and they were willing to do that, which I mean is a, a huge testament to their heart for taking care of children and, and wanting to help out kids in need. But with that being said, they had to wait for about three years. There was another couple in my church had to wait for over two years and actually had two children that the biological mother within the span of a week decided that she wanted them back. And that's something that's allowed, which, you know, they were really glad that the, the baby gets to grow up with their biological mother, but it broke their heart to have to send their baby back after three or four days of having the baby in their house. Uh, finally, with the third baby, they were able to keep the baby. And uh, so they adopted actually three times. Uh, I, there's a couple I've actually had him on my show. He's been a guest on my show that went through the foster care system himself. And they adopted uh, two brothers and a sister because they were hard to place because people didn't want to take all of them and they didn't want to break up the family if they could help it. And so they were like, yeah, we'll adopt three kids at one time. They went from having no kids to three kids overnight, which is just astounding. But I, and I could go story after story after story after story about this. Um, people here at Faulkner, people at, at Dalrada Church of Christ, at 10th Street Church of Christ. But the point is, if you are somebody that is religious, you know that that is the case, that Christians are people that have to wait a very long time to adopt, and they're still willing to do it despite the cost, despite the weight, all of those things. The idea that there would just be, if we got rid of abortions, that there would be troves and troves of babies with nowhere to go and just winding up in the foster care system, it's just not true. The last stat I saw, if I'm, if I'm remembering my stats correctly, there are 27 parents waiting for a baby to every one child that's adopted. If we outlawed all abortion tomorrow, we would still have a surplus of parents waiting to adopt. So the idea that these, these babies, if they were born, would be unwanted and not have loving homes to go to, it's simply not true. The data does not support that conclusion. But let's go ahead and look at this one as well. This is from the, uh, and this is actually a government source. This is the National Library of Medicine. And in their finding, look at this. Our meta-analysis results suggest that political conservatives are significantly more charitable than liberals at the overall level. So even the government study that tends to, let's be honest, be a little bit more favorable towards liberals, even if you're not talking about Christians themselves, political conservatives, which obviously tend to be the ones that are more pro-life, they give more to charity than liberals do. That was clear by the metadata, according to their study. And let's also specifically look at crisis pregnancy centers. These are ministries that are set up largely by Christians specifically to help women in exactly the circumstance that they're talking about, about women that are scared and have an unwanted pregnancy. Well, that's the purpose of crisis pregnancy centers. It's the reason that they exist. And Christians have set up these ministries all over the country to help women in these situations. So let's look at this one. And this is, again, from the National Library of Medicine. It says uh, CPCs, so crisis pregnancy centers, have been around since the late 1960s, primarily in states that permitted abortion but their numbers grew significantly during the 1980s and 1990s after the national legalization of abortion. According to the National Abortion Rights League, an advocacy organization committed to ensuring abortion access, there are an estimated 2,500 crisis pregnancy centers in the United States compared to 800 abortion clinics. So what we're looking at here is that across the country, 2,500 crisis pregnancy centers set up by Christians largely to support women in exactly the scenario that liberals are telling us that Christians and, and conservatives just don't care about.
Let's go ahead and look in this same article from the National Library of Medicine. Uh, let's see, let's go down here. Oh, while CPCs have a right to exist and can provide valued emotional, spiritual, and maternal, e.g. diapers and formula, support for women, uh, they go on to say they often engage in practices that are dubious at best and unethical at worst. And then it goes on to say basically that uh, it doesn't like the fact that these crisis pregnancy centers tell women that they don't have to have an abortion and they try to talk them out of it, which is true. I mean, that's, that's part of the purpose of crisis pregnancy centers, which I applaud. That's the right thing for them to do. Uh, I do think it's hilarious that they uh, get mad and huffy. It's like, how dare they tell women that they have other options other than killing their baby? It always has struck me as really weird that liberals get very upset at the prospect that babies might, you know, live. It seems a weird thing to dislike. But regardless, uh, you can actually see from this article that it's a very anti-crisis pregnancy center article. And even they had to admit that they provide valued emotional, spiritual, and material support, including things like diapers, formula, and other support for women. And then it says in the next paragraph here, most crisis pregnancy centers are affiliated with evangelical Christian networks and national anti-abortion organizations. So there you have it, right from the horse's mouth, from an anti-pro-life uh, article, an article that is very in favor of the abortion industry. They had to say, yeah, there's about 2,500 of these things. They're run almost exclusively by people that don't like abortion and people that are Christians and evangelical. Oh, and they also provide a whole lot of support for women across the country that even we have to say is valuable and that they provide a valuable service for all of these women, including things like counseling, like you know different uh, things, diapers, formula, all these things that they may need for a baby. They do all those things. So I want you to contrast that with, for example, Planned Parenthood claiming that, oh, only 3% of what we do is abortions. And then even the Washington Post, a far uh, left-leaning publication, had to say, yeah, that's a bald-faced lie. We're giving that four Pinocchios. That's, abortion is pretty much all that they do. Whereas crisis pregnancy centers, even their opponents had to admit, yeah, they do actually give an awful lot for things like formula and things that the moms might actually need. That's a pretty stark contrast. And it proves the point that I've been saying this entire time that Christians actually, yeah, they do kind of care an awful lot about the babies and the moms. And it's not just about preventing abortion, but also improving the quality of life for these women that are in crisis. And I've always found it very ironic that despite all of this, it is the pro-abortion crowd that is standing in the way of women getting this kind of help that are standing against these charities. And you don't have to take my word for it. Go ahead and take a look at this. This is from Heritage, Illinois, which, you know, by the way, a blue state. Illinois is one of the most prominent examples where FBAs, that's faith-based agencies, have been compelled to cease their child welfare services. In 2011, Illinois told child welfare providers they must be willing to place children with same-sex couples regardless of religious beliefs that might prohibit them from doing so. Catholic Charities, remember the same one that we were talking about earlier in the show, had provided care to 82,000 children. Catholic Charities, one of the most prominent networks affected by this policy, was forced to end its contract with the state. An estimated 2,000 to 3,000 children were displaced from faith-based associations because of this, and the state shuffled them into other agencies. So the left, because of their insane sexual agenda, where they're trying to promote homosexuality has gone so crazy and so radical on this. They were willing to strip children out of care that they were getting from Catholic agencies basically for free in order to put them and shuffle them around into government agencies that they felt would provide care at taxpayer expense, by the way, instead of letting the private charities take care of them. And I mean, for kids that already have issues with being displaced, that seems pretty heartless and cruel to me anyway. But, you know, no sense of uh, corruption or no reason other than just, well, we don't like the fact that they're not going to place people with gay couples. There you have it, though. That's, that's how insane these people are. It's funny that they'll say Christians are the ones that don't care about the kids, but then they'll overtly do things that are not in the kids' best interest as long as it fits their political agenda. And by the way, that's not the only example of that. The same article from Heritage goes on to say this. In 2010, 
Washington, D.C. ended its partnership with Catholic Charities. After 100 years of service, Catholic Charities in Boston and San Francisco were forced in 2006 to stop providing foster and adoptive services for the same reason. The organization had found homes for tens of thousands of children in Boston over the years, quote, more than any other agency in the state, unquote, according to the Boston Globe. Not exactly a conservative news source there. So you're seeing there that it, it's so funny that they will always accuse the Christians of being the ones that are zealous and they're, they only care about themselves and their political agenda and all of their religion is just uh, their religious agenda cloaked in, in terms of religious liberty and all those things. And that's not really actually what they're for. Uh, but they're perfectly fine just scrapping Christians doing good work and trying to help uh, children that are in need if it suits their political agenda. If you step out of line, they will come after you, even if you've had a hundred year history with placing children in the city and helping them out at no cost to the state. They don't care. They will shut you down if you do not toe the line on their crazy training madness agenda. And, you know, again, this is just another illustration of the same thing, but here's Elizabeth Warren saying that they need to shut down crisis pregnancy centers that are doing all this good work that the, that her own government that she is a part of admits is doing a lot of good work for women, even though they don't like the fact that they uh, actively promote a pro-life message. In Massachusetts right now, those crisis pregnancy centers that are there to fool people who are looking for pregnancy termination help outnumber true abortion clinics by three to one. We need to shut them down here in Massachusetts and we need to shut them down all around the country. You should not be able to torture a pregnant person like that. Oh my gosh. Did you know that, that crisis pregnancy centers are torturing pregnant women by, you know, telling them that maybe they should let their baby live and that they shouldn't have a dangerous and invasive medical procedure to kill the baby living inside of them that can cause all kinds of psychological side effects and medical side effects. Oh, and, you know, by the way, they're going to give them a lot of free stuff like formula, diapers, uh, you know, different baby furniture, all these other things. Man the torture that is going on inside there. I mean, it's it's just like the Spanish Inquisition. They're bringing these pregnant women in there and giving them free ultrasounds and free medical care and free stuff to take care of their baby and saying, oh, and by the way, we actually think it would be a really good idea if you don't, you know, kill your children. How dare they? But this is how the left thinks. They would rather, to suit their own political agenda, shut down people that are doing charitable work at no cost to them just because it doesn't fit their agenda. It doesn't fit the narrative. You see, they are the only ones that are allowed to care about moms. And the only way that you're allowed to care about those moms is to tell them that they would be far better off if they just killed their babies. I don't know what kind of crazy backwards universe you're living in if you can actually think that that is the best thing for a mom in crisis. But apparently that is the case. And you want to actively stop people from helping women in other cases. You know, the reverse of this argument that I've heard people on the right making for a long time when it comes to things like Planned Parenthood, we already talked about, even the Washington Post had to say, give four Pinocchios when they said, oh, only 3% of what we do is actually abortion. Uh, well, that's blatantly false. And even the Washington Post acknowledged that. But every conservative I know that, that I've spoken to when that article came out said, yeah, Planned Parenthood just stopped the baby killing. We wouldn't care if Planned Parenthood, I don't care how liberal they are. As long as they're doing good things for moms and, and you know, giving things like prenatal vitamins, which is a, an extremely tiny fraction of the things, the, the services they actually provide. Uh, but if that's what they were doing, I don't have a problem with them. It's just the baby killing. If they just stopped doing that, I wouldn't care what other charitable actions they did. In fact, I'd applaud them for doing so. But on the other side, if people are telling them, we really think that you should, you know, keep your baby alive. Well, they just can't stand that. And those people have to be shut down. Even if they are, you know, providing a whole lot of helpful charitable services for the moms. That's how these people think. And it really is sick. And it's funny to me that this whole argument, this whole line of thinking started with, well, you only care about the baby, not the mom. And then we actually do things 
that help the mom in crisis and they say, well, we need to shut down those crisis, uh, those crisis pregnancy centers that are helping the moms. And then they say, well, you only care about the babies before they're born. After they're born, you don't care about the babies. And then they try to shut down all the Christian adoption agencies that are helping the babies once they're born. And so it's funny, they're, they're almost trying to do a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're trying to make an argument and they're trying to shut down all of the mediums that prove that their point is incorrect. See, they'd rather shut down the argument than actually have the discussion. And they'd rather paint you as some kind of heartless monster rather than allow other people to see your good deeds and just judge for themselves who's on the right side and who's not on that. You see, if a pro-abortion person does ask you any of this stuff, you can provide all of these things, and I've provided all the sources, and you can make mention of all of these things. However, I will say this. Sometimes they try to make the same argument, but do it on a personal level. They try to ask what you personally are doing to help kids in need. And if they do that, and you don't have a good answer, now you shouldn't do it just to win the argument. But I would actually challenge you to try to do something that does help people, moms, babies in need, whatever it is. Take that as a personal challenge, because sometimes criticism, even if it's you know made in bad faith and coming from an extremely bad and demonic source, can point out some of our shortcomings on some things. And so if you are a Christian that cares about this, maybe considering making a, a donation to a charity like Preborn or a charity like uh, Image Clear that works here in Montgomery that give free, free ultrasounds to women that are in crisis, that kind of thing. Uh, feel free to do something like that and, and take that kind of as a challenge to help out with something like that. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman. So if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?